I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous podcast of Journey Through the Scriptures, episode 34, we read about the seventh and the final seal on the scroll being broken at the beginning of Revelation chapter 8. This is the scroll which Jesus Christ, the only worthy one, had taken from the hand of God the Father. As he breaks that final seal and the scroll is fully unrolled, the whole of heaven grows silent for about half an hour. This silence is an intense anticipation of what is about to happen. This silence communicates in a dramatic way the full and awesome authority of God because everything must wait for Him. Following the silence, John sees seven angels who have been given seven trumpets. These are the trumpets of God's judgment about to be sounded on the earth. We finished up the last podcast learning about the appearance of a special angel just before the other seven archangels sound their trumpets. Many Bible scholars regard this great angel as Jesus himself who appeared in the Old Testament as the angel of Yahweh, or the angel of Jehovah, leading his people through the wilderness. In Revelation 8 verses 3 to 5, this angel offers incense, mixed with the prayers of all the saints, up before God from the golden altar of incense. Then to signal the beginning of the judgments of God, the angel at the altar hurls a censer filled with the fiery coals from the altar onto the earth, which causes thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This announces the beginning of God's judgment on the earth. From Revelation 8 verses 6 through to 12, we have come to one of the most difficult sections of the book to interpret. There has been a lot of debate as to whether these judgments are literal, in other words, a physical judgment upon the earth, or if these judgments are symbolic, a picture of something else much worse. But as with all difficult passages of Scripture, With a little bit of practice, wisdom, and insight from the Holy Spirit, we can discover what the correct interpretation is. Always remember that Revelation is a book of symbols, a revealing of God's plans. The Greek word for revelation is apocalypse, which literally means an unveiling. A revelation, therefore, is a removal of the veil which obscures our understanding. It unravels the mystery. It explains the meaning. The book of Revelation should never be read as a historical record of future events, or even a chronological account of a series of events. What does Revelation 8 verses 6 to 12 say? Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire, mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers, and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, A third of the waters became wormwood, and many people died from the water, because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. This is how God frequently works. He reveals something invisible by means of a literal event. For example, the sun is literal. It is the star that warms our planet Earth and keeps our entire solar system functioning. However, at the same time, the sun is also symbolic. It is used throughout scripture as such. We refer to it as a symbol of light, knowledge and truth. Fire too is literal. You can burn yourself badly with fire but it is also symbolic of anguish and judgment. In the opening chapter of the prophet Joel in the Old Testament, he describes a plague of locusts that comes upon the earth and eats up every green thing. Joel describes them in dramatic and accurate terms, but his description soon becomes a portrayal of the invasion of a great army from Babylon that will soon come into the land. Israel, throughout its history, always used literal trumpets to publicly announce something that is about to happen. 
In the same way, through this series of seven trumpets, we are hearing God's announcement of severe judgment that is about to take place. These judgments are not something new in history. God has often acted in judgment upon men. Jesus once rebuked the Pharisees of his day because they could interpret the signs of bad weather ahead, but they did not know how to understand the times. Just as the HIV virus robs people of the immunity against other infections, so the Bible says indulgence in sexual promiscuity robs us of any defense against the widespread theological and moral errors of our day. That is why people end up in strange cults and stray because their moral defenses have been torn down by sexual promiscuity. What about abortion? What does that portray? Like the ancient people of Israel, we are throwing our children into the vast burning mouth of the god Molech, deliberately sacrificing to our own self-centeredness. Now let us look at these trumpets and see what they bring. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire, mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. This is very similar to the seventh plague that fell on Egypt in the time of Exodus, when hail and lightning came upon the whole land. Here, in Revelation, it is mingled with blood. This is not a new or unusual phenomenon. Scientists have recorded many times when red rain fell from the sky, leaving great puddles of water that were red as blood. Here is the same plague hitting the earth. It brings terrible destruction of the natural world. Notice how the plagues of the first four trumpets all fall on creation. This is God's judgment upon humans that have destroyed their environment. This is fully in line with God's methods of judgment. Not only is the destruction literal, but it is also symbolic. The earth is used in scripture as a picture of Israel, the chosen nation of God. So this also depicts a judgment upon Israel, both on its leaders, represented by the trees, and upon its people, represented by the grass. The prophet Jeremiah and other prophets of the Old Testament prophesied about a time when God would judge his people Israel. The prophecy of Zephaniah is one such example. Zephaniah 1 verses 12 to 13 says, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, The Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. In Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7, this is referred to as a time of distress for Jacob. This is the effect of the first trumpet. The second judgment follows in Revelation 8 verses 8 to 9. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The first trumpet judgment affected the earth, but this judgment affects the sea. A great blazing mountain is seen falling into the sea. Perhaps it is a volcanic eruption similar to Mount St. Helens, or perhaps it is a meteor falling out of space into the ocean. After this event, the sea literally becomes blood red. Every now and then, the papers report red tide, which appears in the sea and turns large areas of the ocean blood red. It is caused by a tiny marine organism, red in color and toxic, that multiplies at such an enormous rate that it makes the water look like blood. This plague destroys many of the living creatures in the sea, and the ships are destroyed, and the commerce of the ocean reduced by a third. But if it is literal, it is also symbolic. Jeremiah, for instance, describes Babylon as a mountain in Jeremiah 51 verses 24 to 26. I will repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea before your very eyes for all the evil that they have done in Zion, declares the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, declares the Lord, which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you into a burnt mountain. No stone shall be taken from you for a corner, and no stone for a foundation. 
and you shall be a perpetual waste, declares the Lord. Jeremiah calls Babylon a destroying mountain, which is a destroyer of the earth. Symbolically, Revelation 8 verses 8 to 9 could portray the rise of what is popularly called the revived Roman Empire, the ten kingdomed coalition of European nations under the Antichrist, which conquers other nations of the earth. Symbolically, the sea is used frequently to signify the Gentile nations of earth. Again, it is limited to one third. Notice the repetition of this word, the third, all through the series of trumpet judgments. Under the judgments of the seven seals, the limitation was one fourth of the earth. That is very significant. Four is the number of human government, and under the seal judgments, God will use human government to limit the onslaught of the four terrible horsemen of chapter 6. Human government will still have some restraining power during these days, but here even that power is gone, and under the trumpet judgments only God himself can restrain. Three is the divine number, and this tells us that only God's mercy and God's grace will limit these awful judgments to one-third of the earth. Now we come to the third trumpet in Revelation 8, verses 10 to 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water, because it had been made bitter. This great star which falls into the rivers and the fountains of the earth could be a comet which breaks up when it enters the atmosphere and scatters itself throughout the earth, falling into the rivers and springs and poisoning them with some form of poisonous radiation. We mustn't forget the terrible atomic accident that happened in Russia in 1986. It occurred at a nuclear power plant called Chernobyl, and Chernobyl is the Russian word for wormwood. At the same time that this physical event takes place, it would also symbolize something that will happen in the invisible realm. Rivers, of course, symbolize masses of people moving in the same direction. Whole peoples who are caught up with one idea and moving like a river does in a predictable direction. Fountains or springs denote the sources of moral or philosophical leadership, and a star is used in scripture to symbolize a prominent leader. It could be that some great personality, globally recognized as a leader, falls morally or abandons his philosophy. Many people are embittered by this and begin to oppose and fight one another, resulting in widespread moral death. This is described later in chapter 9 of Revelation. Under the rule of the beast that comes from the earth, there is a similar star when we hear the fifth and sixth trumpets of judgment. Revelation 8 verses 12 is a parallel reference to the same prophetic event that Jesus talks about in Luke 21 verses 25 to 26. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and the third of the sun was struck, and the third of the moon, and the third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. The judgment of the first trumpet affected the earth. The second trumpet judgment affected the seas, the third affected the fresh water sources, and now the fourth trumpet announces a judgment that affects the heavenly bodies like the sun, the moon, and the stars. Not only is it literal, the sun and the moon and the stars can be, for many reasons, darkened and fail to give their light for much of the time, but it can also symbolize something else. Sun, moon, and stars are used in various places in Scripture to signify earthly authorities. The highest, of course, is the king or the president. He would be portrayed as the sun, and those under him would be as the moon and the stars. They symbolize a hierarchy of authority. But what does this darkening mean, symbolically? It portrays insight and moral judgment being withdrawn from the authorities of the earth. They are morally darkened and no longer able to display moral judgment. They are not governed by any sense of ethical restraint, but become characterized by deepening deceit, treachery, and a total lack of justice. Yet still, by the grace of God, this darkening is still limited to one-third. Some restraint of evil is yet possible, but only by the sovereign grace 
of a sovereign God. It will be helpful for you to remember that in Revelation, there are three series of seven events that occupy the last seven years of human history. Each of these series of sevens is broken into four events and then three events. Four of those events are visible and easy to recognize, and then three events that are going on behind the scenes, in the spiritual realm. In Revelation 8 verses 13, there is a break between the first four trumpets and the last three trumpets. Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth, at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. You might have a translation that reads angel, but older or more accurate manuscripts use the word eagle here. In the Old Testament, the eagle is a frequent symbol used by the prophets to represent enemy nations that attack suddenly and unexpectedly. Both the Babylonian and Egyptian rulers were characterized as eagles in Ezekiel 17 verses 3 and verses 7. Eagles are used in the book of Revelation to represent creatures attending God's throne and announcing the judgment messages of God for those on earth, and they portray swiftness and farsightedness. Three great disasters are yet ahead, and these woe judgments are going to fall upon those who dwell on the earth. Again, some of the common Bible translations do not make a very accurate translation of this verse, incorrectly referring to the inhabitants of the earth. The original Greek literally says, those who make their home on earth. It does not mean people who live on the earth, because there are many of those, and, as I have already explained in previous podcasts, some will be redeemed. But these judgments fall upon those people who live only for earth and its advantages, who are merely concerned for this life and care nothing about the life to come. Do you know people like that? All they seem to think about is eating, sleeping, and satisfying their needs. They have no thought for the purpose of life or the meaning of their own existence. What we are told here is that these last three trumpets will give us insight into the full extent of the moral disaster that the first four have brought upon the earth. We have so far seen in each of these series a division of four and three. In the seals, there were four horsemen who rode through the earth and then we were given insight into what was going on behind the scenes, under the next three seals. So here, there are four trumpets that have sounded, and then we get a deeper insight in the last three of the terrible impact of these awful judgments. In the bowls of wrath that are coming in the following chapters, we have again the same division of four and three. In English grammar, we have three common degrees of comparison. There are three ways to indicate increasing value. First, it is big, that is the positive. The comparative is bigger, and the superlative is biggest. With reference to evil, there is bad, worse, and worst. This is what we have in these series, a climaxing of judgment, a crescendo that ends at last with the pouring out of the bowls of the wrath of God, the worst of all. Why do we feel uncomfortable when you read of judgments like these? Eugene Peterson, a Christian writer, says, We do everything we can to make light of judgment. We use every stratagem we can find to avoid dealing with the consequences of sin. But God will not let us off. He will not indulge our inattention. He will be taken seriously. In a pause between the trumpet blasts, an eagle cries its warning. However practice we become at tuning out sounds that we do not want to hear, including the sound of God's displeasure at sin, God finds new ways to penetrate our defensive deafness. The eagle cry catches us off guard. What we are seeing here in the judgments of the last days is really something new. It is simply common penalties for evil increasing in amount to an incredible degree. God has been sending judgments like this all through the history of mankind. There have been volcanic eruptions, meteors falling upon the earth, red rain from the skies, poisoned waters, and so on. All these terrible disasters have struck before, and now they grow to a climax. Yet we must not misunderstand them, for they are for our own good. There are five effects of judgment. Hardships, trials, and difficulties are all a part of judgment of God upon human evil. 
and we all experience it. Judgments frighten us. They are intended to. They are sent to get our attention. They alarm us. Judgments also sober us. How many people throughout the world have rearranged their priorities after the start of the global COVID-19 pandemic? That is also what judgments do. They help us reassess our lives. They change our priorities. C.S. Lewis says that fear or pain or judgment is God's megaphone to reach a deaf world. Judgments correct us. They force us to face unpleasant facts about ourselves. We do not like that. We do not like to be told that we are not perfect. We know we are not, but we do not like anyone else to tell us so. It makes us uncomfortable. Judgment strips away our illusions and restores us to reality. We begin to think accurately, clearly, as God thinks. We plan more carefully. We live more thoughtfully. That is why God sends judgment. Judgments humble us. We begin to see we are really not in control. We do not run everything about our lives. We are not little gods, capable of doing anything we want to, as the media keeps trying to tell us. We are not in charge. We begin at last to welcome guidance, to listen to others, and especially to seek out the wisdom of the Word of God. Judgments reassure us. It comforts us. It answers Habakkuk's prayer in chapter 3, verses 2 of his prophecy, which says, In wrath, remember mercy. We learn that God does not crave judgment either. Isaiah 28 verses 21 describes his judgments as strange and alien. God gives ample warnings before it becomes unbearable. He sends forceful reminders to remind us that this kind of thing can happen so that we might pay attention and act before it gets out of hand. Psalm 103 verses 8 should always be a source of comfort to you. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. What does it tell us about our God? It is strange that people who do not read the Bible invariably say when you talk about judgment that God is a loving God and he would never allow anything like that. But it is the very love of God that makes him judge. God must judge in order to eliminate evil. God has spared us, protected us, and watched over us throughout the ages until now. All that is needed to turn earth into the scenes we have just read about is to remove the strengths of human evil for a little while, and it could be like the scenes in Revelation 8 tomorrow. None of these judgments that we are reading about have been sent by God to surprise us. Over and over and over He has warned us. The warnings came from the prophets of the Old Testament. They came from the lips of Jesus. They came from the pens of the apostles and finally comes in the book of Revelation. The choice is ours to accept the salvation and deliverance of Christ or to face the judgment of Almighty God. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 35.